Hi everyone, uh, my name is Vincent Wartenweiler. I am a data curator with Porta Sophia. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you about an interesting project I've been working on with regard to LSD archives, um, and I'll get right into it here. So the title of my presentation today is Psychedelic Archival Spelunking, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, subtitled Exploring the Hidden Gems and Dark Corners of LSD Research Archives. Just a little bit more about me. I am a two-time graduate of the UW-Madison School of Pharmacy, received my PharmD from UW in 2021, and I received my master's in psychoactive pharmaceutical investigation in 2023. So this is Psychedelics has kind of been a big part of my life for the last several years, and I'm excited to talk about this project to you all. Um, just to orient you to what we will be discussing today, I have laid out kind of a brief agenda here. First, I'll begin with an introduction to my topic and the importance of psychedelic archival work. Next, I'll discuss a brief note on nomenclature when navigating psychedelic archives. Then I'll move specifically into an overview of the archives I've been exploring um, along with the nature of the project. The next three sections kind of involve what I'll refer to as case series um, among the archives that fall into each of these categorically interesting spaces. So the ugly, the bad, and the good. I will be going through these cases in somewhat antithetical oppositional way. So rather than good, bad, ugly, I'll be going ugly, bad, good. Um, starting with some of the more unique studies involving LSD. Then I'll move into some of the perhaps darker and potentially contentious studies of LSD. And then we'll end the case series highlighting some more respectable LSD studies, uh, many of which mirror a lot of the research happening with LSD and psychedelics at large today. I'll have a moment of recap in there somewhere and then end with some concluding remarks. So as some of you may be aware, there was a time in which LSD was manufactured for research purposes and moderately commercialized. Though it was not an FDA approved product, um, Sandoz manufactured LSD under the trade name Delicid you see here in the late 1940s and had a particular interest in researching its clinical uses. So the availability of LSD for research purposes was a multinational affair, um, including studies from the US, Germany, and Italy, just to name a few. Um, a physical annotated bibliography of these various clinical and preclinical studies of LSD um, conducted in the 50s and 60s exists at Purdue University, highlighting a number of interesting studies um, not captured elsewhere in the literature. So as is the case for numerous psychedelic substances, um, without methods of capturing this research and this history, there exists a great risk of losing some of these studies. So this brings me to another general point. It's true that history can be painted as a boring and stuffy subject. However, working with these archives helped me realize just how important archival research is to the field of psychedelic science at large. Um, archival research is a means of preserving history. Um, without archives, it is difficult to assemble a complete picture of the psychedelic industry. Um, and the existence of such, and study of such pieces means we're better able to assess the validity of current research initiatives honoring the past without repeating its failures and capitalizing on the successes of yesterday to pave the way forward. So this means preventing the repetition of ineffective or harmful research. Um, and finally, living in the technological age um, allows us to capture these archives digitally, therefore increasing their accessibility um, and enable um, and helps us support Porta Sophia's mission to protect the public domain, stimulate innovation, and enable good patents to assure psychedelic therapies are available at scale to people who need them. And uh, what follows is a pretty dis frank discussion of psychedelics in a historical context. Um, it is important to note that many words and phrases were used in ways that we now know to be unacceptable. Um, namely, research in this age does not utilize people first language um, that we've come to expect with more contemporary research. I'll do my best to kind of point out areas in which we have edited our use of language compared to what was deemed normal and natural um, in this previous time period. And additionally, I wanna note that while this um, talk is included as part of an indigenous awareness series, my particular work on this has not been directly indigenous related. Um, rather, this work focuses on similar, similarly silenced parts of history, um, which is why it's included in this series. The other talks um, that follow in this series will have a more explicit focus on indigeneity within the psychedelic space. Um, one important takeaway I want to instill in y'all is that 
the names of these drugs, so psilocybin, LSD, mescaline, need not be perceived as dirty words or stigmatized language. Um, just because something is illegal doesn't mean that it's wrong, bad, or shameful to speak about and to discuss. Um, this is something that I've personally struggled with and hope to not pass along to others. So if the field is to advance, develop, and evolve, there needs to be room for um, and openness and honesty to discuss these substances, their history, and their science. So studying these archives has helped me understand the ways new potential research avenues can be opened up. For example, um, neurohormonal um, LSD experiments appear in the archives, and yet this was not something I recall in my master's curriculum. Um, so was this a dead end in research, or perhaps was it an active line of study that simply got buried due to governmental and regulatory red tape? Um, thus, these archives offer a potential treasure trove of undiscovered and understudied research topics, which is quite exciting. All right, just a quick note on the archives and their availability. As I mentioned, these archives are housed within a larger collection at Purdue University. This particular bibliography involves article citations concerning the use of LSD in preclinical and human research. Um, each entry is named LSD X, so LSD 1, LSD 2, LSD 157. Um, you'll see examples of those throughout the presentation here. I've just done screen grabs of the archives themselves, and some are screen grabs of the Porta Sophia website, um, where some of these curations already exist. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the number after LSD simply refers to the order that it appears in the collection. Um, and in particular, this collection is housed at the Purdue University Archives and Special Collections, covering a time between the late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, I've included a general link here to Purdue's online archives, um, and uh, in case you'd like to explore that on your own time. It's important to note that the archives I've been working with um, are not directly accessible via this link. Um, rather, a team member was able to travel to Purdue and got permission to photograph the annotated bibliography, which I am in the process of digitizing, transcribing, and uploading to Porta Sophia's online database. So that's another space that you could look to explore if you um, kind of want to delve into these archives yourself. All right, that concludes the portion of the talk where I'm speaking on the background of the project and some introduction. And next I'll move into discussion of some interesting areas in the Sandoz annotated bibliographies themselves. Um, and just as a reminder, I've classified these in three broad areas, which are laid out here on the slide, um, kind of renamed them from their original good, bad, and ugly. So the ugly, um, also known as the interesting, the bad, also known as the lessons, and the good, also known as the respectable. So one serious limitation of this archival project in particular is that the archives only contain brief extractions of full research projects that are described. So for example, Many archival um, entries are only about three to four sentences, which briefly describe the research that was conducted and perhaps give a short mention of the results that were obtained. Therefore, it can be quite difficult to discern exactly what was being studied and why it was being studied. Um, however, it seems like a lot of these preclinical studies occurred in atypical animal species, so things like clams and fighting fish and salamander. Um, these studies seem to focus on drug action of LSD, noting various effects on serotonin in the different animal species. Um, and many of these animal studies also investigated the action of LSD at particular areas of the nervous system. So um, an example with the different region of the brain um, or within different areas of the spinal cord. And additionally, many studies involved a combination of drugs such as LSD derivatives or theorized LSD blocking agents. More on that later. Um, one particular interesting study from this set is LSD-346. Um, so it's a study on rats and iodine uptake. Um, from the citation, it appears that researchers were attempting to study both the LSD blocking effects of reserpine and possible effects on thyroid function and iodide utilization. Um, LSD-346 refers to a study that was published in the Indian Journal of Pharmacy in 1956, which loosely overlaps with the discovery and commercialization of Synthroid, um, otherwise known as levothyroxine, um, a commonly prescribed drug today. So is it possible that LSD had a role to play in the development of today's preferred treatment for thyroid deficiency? There's likely a lot to unpack there, but it's an interesting premise nonetheless. So this is just one kind of unique example from those preclinical studies of LSD. 
Um, another interestingly ugly topical area of study from this set of archives has to do with possible neurohormonal effects of LSD, both in humans and various animals. Um, and as a graduate of the UWPPI program, I recall learning a lot about the neuropsychopharmacology of LSD. However, we didn't fully explore the neural hormonal effects of LSD. Um, and it's fully possible that there are links and correlations to be explored here with respect to LSD and antidiuresis. Um, this example, LSD 220, or 291, is kind of displayed on the screen here. Um, it talks about uh, giving humans 100 micrograms of intravenous LSD and then measuring urine output in uh, male human subjects. So while it does not appear that antidiuretic hormone levels, ADH levels, were directly assessed, the authors seem to extrapolate that the effect of LSD on urine output is associated with a hypothalamic release of LSD. So again, kind of an interesting area where we're left to wonder, like, was this a dead end in research? Was there um, a possible like through line here, something that could be discussed in research further that just got lost to time? Um, one of the many interesting reasons we study archives. And then moving on, crossing, crossing over into the bad realm or um, the cautionary tale kind of realm, there's certainly much worthy of discussion in the various cases of LSD being used to treat various sexual neuroses. Um, I'll do my best to keep this context within the, the Sandoz bibliography, though it's worth noting um, there's a much larger history of LSD and sexuality that goes beyond this individual collection of archives. Um, while inarguably we live in an age of more acceptance and diversity than when these writings were produced, um, I'd be lying if I said it didn't hurt a bit to go through references like this one. Um, as a queer person and as an advocate for psychedelics, um, this reference was uncomfortable and challenging to come to grips with the idea that LSD might be used as a form of treatment for homosexuality or in um, a conversion therapy type way. Um, this prior art is also interesting with respect to avenues of anti-liberal uses of LSD and psychedelics at large. So there's a common belief out there which supports the notion that psychedelic usage inherently produces a more liberal and socialist worldview. Um, however, there's an inherent bias to this preconception as the usage of psychedelics in conservative populations is also well documented. Um, and if we are continue to, continuing to move the field of psychedelics forward, it's important to begin to reckon with the potentially problematic current and historical usage of these substances rather than sweeping them under the rug. Another potentially problematic area of research in this age was the use of psychedelics on protected populations. So a simple search in Fort Sophia's database using Sandoz and schizophrenia as your search terms yields 63 results, um, most of which um, involve the administration of LSD on subjects with schizophrenia. Um, I've pulled just a few here um, as examples and as a point of reference, but rest assured there were a plethora of studies during this time using LSD as a model for psychosis and also directly administering LSD in subjects with active psychosis. So studies like these certainly would not fly nowadays. Um, and in fact, Schizophrenia and family history of schizophrenia are oftentimes exclusion criteria for participating in psychedelic clinical trials. All right, so just a brief recap of, of bubs and uh, buds and barbs here. Um, in, in terms of the Sandoz bibliography specifically, as well as archival work in general, um, here's a little slide kind of highlighting what we've discussed already. In terms of positives, doing this kind of work can lead to interesting, undiscovered bodies of work and research topics within psychedelics. Um, it's also important to note how investigating archives can be a cautionary tale for current researchers, increasing efficiency and preventing further harm to vulnerable populations. Um, additionally, this work is important as it increases access to archival documents through transcription and digitization of otherwise difficult to access documents. On the negative end of things, this work specifically has highlighted the unfortunate treatment of queer people in the psychedelic or psychiatric and medical complexes, even within recent decades. Um, it should be stated that archival work is something of a mystery. When working with bits and pieces rather than full text research documents, there are a lot of holes and a lot of gaps, particularly in the methodology of these experiments. Um, and lastly, it can be hard to avoid presentism and if anyone's heard this term before, maybe um, feel free to, to drop it in the chat. But otherwise, presentism is essentially the use of 
present values and beliefs from today's society to judge and analyze the actions and experiments of the past. It's a huge problem for historians, for social scientists and archivists, and it's certainly a concept that pertains to the work I have been doing um, with the Sandoz annotated bibs. Okay, so we're through a lot of the muck of it and on to more positives, more greener pastures. Um, I don't wanna understate the importance of archival research for its ability to show us the mistakes of the past, um, but it is equally valid and exciting to find respectable and reputable gems from the archives, which reflect and corroborate our current approaches to psychedelic science and the clinical uses of psychedelics. So while the subjective and mystical effects of psychedelics like LSD have been known for a long time, uh, less attention seems to have been given to the possible reversal agents and non-hallucinogenic psychedelics. So thankfully, there are abundant entries in the Sandoz Annotated Bibliography exploring these concepts. Researchers go so far as to hypothesize mechanistic approaches to the trip-killing effects of agents like chlorpromazine, azacyclinol, um, and reserpine. So as noted in this... Um, bibliography entry I pulled here, LSD-199. Um, it appears that researchers were struggling to kind of accurately characterize the impact of reserpine on LSD's, LSD's subjective effects. Um, while reserpine is scarcely used today due to many unfortunate side effects, researchers in this time period were quite interested in the discovery of trip killers. Um, some reports seem to say co-administration with reserpine actually intensifies the LSD experience while others indicate reserpine might slightly reduce or slightly bolster the LSD response. Um, despite the jumbled relationship between LSD and reserpine, it seems pretty clear that chlorpromazine strongly attenuates and in some cases fully blocks the psychedelic effects of LSD. Um, and the takeaway I've gathered from reviewing a handful of these snippets seems to be that reserpine might have differential effects on LSD response. And again, we have to just wonder why that is because what we're working from in these cases is a couple sentences from some researchers here rather than a full explanation of their experimental method. Um, and one last item I wanted to pull from in the theme of curative reversal agents is this interesting table. Um, I think it's on the next page here, actually. Um, this refers to LSD-317, which is, again, kind of exploring those different agents in terms of the LSD reaction. Um, and then yeah, here in LSD-352 is an interesting table, again, exploring even more um, compounds on their effects of the LSD response. Um, directing your attention to the bottom of the figure here, which displays how various drugs modulated the subjective effects in, of LSD. But again, like how were these, how were these results achieved? What factors were measured to determine these effects? we might never know. Um, and this again, highlights the detective work involved in archival studies. One excellent thing I've noted in scouring through these citations is just how many of them come from incredibly reputable and recognizable journals. Um, with a big name like Sandoz behind the studies, maybe it's not too surprising to see many articles published in journals like Nature, the New York Academy of Sciences and Neuropsychopharmacology. Um, however, it's interesting to ponder how quickly the governmental and regulatory opinions of substances like LSD seem to shift after the mid-1960s. And after spending several months poring over these annotated bibs, um, I think the most succinct way that I can characterize the spirit of research at, um, in the field at this time is tolerably unhinged. So um, I struggle to think of many research groups or possible study participants today that would be excited about the idea of studying the results of Rorschach tests under the influence of LSD. Uh, however, it's interesting to note the many ways in, in which researchers of the past attempted to characterize, study, and document the psychedelic experience. Um, this is still a problem for researchers today. We do not have great ways to measure and compare psychedelic experiences from individual to individual. Um, 60 to 70 years ago, researchers were utilizing tools like the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality in um, Inventory, the MMPI, um, as well as the 5D ASC, the Five Dimensional Altered States of Consciousness Rating, um, both of which were far from perfect um, and are still used in clinical trials today. So seems that we haven't found many better tools to utilize while still being able to acknowledge the ways um, in which these early inventories were potentially flawed and skewed. 
All right, perhaps one of the most exciting findings I've gathered in my work on this project has been noting and documenting the ways in which these 70 year old entries corroborate and reflect current trends in psychedelic research. So the next few slides will highlight um, a few key areas where the past appears to reflect, reflect the present very nicely. Um, so number one, LSD for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Um, across the annotations and across a handful of the years included, there have been numerous abstracts which describe the benefits of using LSD to assist psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and psychodynamics. Um, listed on the slide are just a few of the instances of these reports. Um, one of them actually appears to be more of a meta-analysis or systematic review, which attempted to synthesize a large number of studies at this time describing the use of LSD for psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Um, that is LSD-329, which describes a large human study of LSD for various psychiatric diseases and quotes have um, the surprising success of LSD in mental health treatment and notes valuable results. Uh, with a three-year observation period across a variety of mental illnesses. So not only was LSD used in short-term psychotherapy, the long-term effects and outcomes of such studies were also being documented at this time. Um, and additionally, many of the annotations include references to other annotations within the bibliography, which also address the use of LSD in psychotherapy. So that's just one point. Um, and this slide is somewhat of a recap from previous points I've made. However, I think it's important to discuss reversal agents um, again in the context of current research, since this is a sometimes uh, a point of contention during psychedelic clinical trials. Hallucinogens have a potent and substantial effect on the sensorium and can produce unpredictable and often uncomfortable experiences. So this begs a couple questions. One, how do we appropriately prepare clinical trial participants for the psychedelic experience? And two, how, um, what can we do to ensure safety is upheld um, for participants, for reasonably maintained for participants in clinical trials? So while trials today often use the serotonin antagonist catanserin um, to blunt the psychedelic experience, it may be prudent to look to past studies with agents such as, again, chlorpromazine, azacyclinol, and reserpine for possible mechanisms to abort a bad trip. And then a final point in which I've thrown in the good bin, we're still in the good bin here, um, is the presence of LSD derivatives in the archives. So while in the modern age, there's a growing number of psychedelic patents that appear to be targeting hypothetical chemical and structural derivatives of psychedelics in an attempt to skirt legal, regulatory, and ethical barriers, um, the presence of such derivatives like bromolysergic acid, which is displayed here on the um, slide, otherwise known as BOL, um, the appearance of these substances in prior art offer another means of combating such overreaching patents and maintaining innovation in the space. Um, in particular, I've seen a lot of ergot-related compounds in the, or the Sandoz annotated bibs, um, and interestingly, the annotations actually appear to refer to a separate collection of entries which specifically deal with BOL. So further investigation is needed on my part to see if perhaps we can gain access to that additional bibliography um, and digitize that into the Porta Sophia library. All right, in summary, we're kind of winding down here. Um, working through the Sandoz annotated bibliography has helped shape my perception of LSD and its unique history. Additionally, this archive it runs the gamut of research from problematic experiments to one-of-a-kind studies to hauntingly familiar research. Um, and lastly, archival work is a lot playing like a lot, a lot playing like detective or solving puzzles. Um, we almost never have the full context of a piece to work from, so we must we must naturally make some assumptions and um, be mindful of presentism in this work. And then just to wrap things up, I kind of want to drive three points home. So firstly, that the value and challenges of archival research cannot be understated. Um, there is value in revisiting previous studies, particularly in a field like psychedelics, wherein the history itself is fraught with gaps, underground research, and moral and ethical dilemmas. The path uh, can be both a source of inspiration and a guidepost. Secondly, Utilizing the past in an analytical way and not letting unfortunate moments or unethical practices be stories. Learning from the past through archival research can and should help us to inform better research practices in the current landscape. 
And then lastly, perhaps most importantly, this work is still actively ongoing. I am approximately 20% of the way through curating these 280 images that, uh, and from that I've already discovered so much as you can already see. So I can scarcely imagine what else may be hiding in these archives waiting to be uncovered. Um, many thanks as always to our collaborators and sponsors. You see them here listed on the slide. And then thank you so much for your energy, your attention and interest today. Um, it's my great pleasure to open up the floor for any questions, comments, concerns. And if there are, are none, I know we're kind of a small group today, so we might just call it. Thank you so much, Vincent. I think we'll just call it. Thank you. Sounds good. I'll stop sharing and carry on. Let you all carry on with the rest of your day.